Hi, folks. Welcome to CICD for PowerShell that isn't a mess. Hopefully, you're in the right room. Uh, I don't like to dwell on bio slides, uh, but there's two things I like to call out here. One, I'm talking about PowerShell, and I work at Microsoft. I do not work on the PowerShell team, so I'm, act I'm, I'm another customer of theirs. I work with their products just like a lot of anybody else who uses PowerShell does. The other is there's this PowerShell Discord and Slack. It's bridged, so if you prefer Discord or Slack or whatever, you can connect to both. Uh, and there's links there to join, aka.ms slash PS Discord and PS Slack. It's a wonderful community full of people who know way too much about PowerShell and related topics that are literally waiting right now to help you wherever you get stuck on topics that I'm about to talk to you about or just in general about PowerShell um, and its related um, topics and systems. So if you do get stuck and you need help, there's lots of great places online, but that Discord and Slack is a seriously underrated place and you should definitely check it out if you're into writing any PowerShell code. I'm starting more and more of my talks this way, where like nothing is easy, but we have this kind of nomenclature, this um, verbiage that follows us around. It's like, oh, it's so easy, you just do this. Or all you gotta do is, or oh, just do this, just do that, just look at this this way. That's kind of a flawed concept in my mind, and I don't really like it because everything that we work on daily requires like years of context, uh, context and prerequisite knowledge. Even just to write one line of code, you have to figure out how to install your IDE or whatever, right? Like most people, or not most people, but a lot of people go to school for this or they spend a lot of time studying on their own and it can become kind of a, a, a almost an intimidating gatekeeping thing where whatever you're working on is not trivial. And so while one of my goals today is to show you that this is really accessible and that there's not a lot that you have to um, get your head around in terms of concepts. Um, but it, none of it is like entry level, like grab anybody off the street and they can do it. So give yourself some credit. That's all I'm really saying. Um, I'm also not really here to tell you um, oh, like a big, I'm not going to show you just a giant YAML file and go through it line by line or anything like that. It's not a one size fits all solution. You have to think a little bit about what it is you're trying to accomplish, what your goals are, and like what your actual tools and people are capable of. And so with that in mind, let's get into it. First, like, who cares, right? Like, why? Oh, PowerShell, it's not a real language, it's whatever. Well, think of all the things that are possibly and likely in a lot of organizations written in PowerShell, because uh, some of it's more than you think. It might be right under your nose. The CI/CD scripts or something. The scripts that you use to build and deploy and manage your uh, systems and apps might be written in PowerShell. It might be written in a lot of things. Help desk tools, things like if you have a line of business app and uh, you wrote a little helper tool for your uh, help desk guys to be able to serve your customers or who knows what, right? Like login scripts, like that's a basic one. Like, especially if you're an ops person. Uh, coming from an ops background, like a lot of PowerShell people are, this is probably a pretty relatable one, something that happens when folks log in. And then kind of what PowerShell was originally designed and built for was to serve operations people, like to have tools that you can interact with. At first, just Microsoft products. Like if, you want, if you've wanted to manage Exchange since like 2007, you've been better off doing it in PowerShell than in many of the other tools that are available to you. And so obviously there's lots more that you can manage other than just Exchange, but things that your ops team writes. And last but not least, cloud management scripts. So infrastructure as a service, or sorry, infrastructure as code, deploying things online is, um, you can use PowerShell to do that in most of the popular clouds. And so this is not an exhaustive list by any means. But when you look at the things that are on this list, they have a potential to have a really big impact to your organization, right? Especially a, a large enterprise with a lot of users working on workstations and things like that. Um, and so the ability to fat finger a command and prod and accidentally delete an OU in Active Directory, not great. You probably want some uh, process and systems around what you're doing with your PowerShell code, right? 
and that kind of is the punchline. The benefits of CI/CD that you appreciate for your apps and services apply to whatever you write in PowerShell. Even if it's just connective scripts, even if it's just things that run on users' uh, workstations when they log in, the benefits that you are hopefully already aware of, because you're at a delivery comp here, they apply to whatever you write in PowerShell as well as whatever you write in any other language. And so it's important to think of it that way as well. So CI/CD for PowerShell that isn't a mess, we gotta kind of talk about what qualifies a mess, right? And I don't say that to put anyone down or make you feel bad about what you do, but it's the title of the talk, so it was gonna show up, right? And again, uh, any one of these on their own doesn't mean your whole system's a mess. They're just kind of messy behaviors that add up to give you kind of a messiness score, if you will. The first is no tests. Who's ever seen like, a script of any language run in prod and it just did whatever it did, or oops, it didn't work and I, we gotta tweak it and try it again. Well, maybe some tests might have helped you, right? People don't necessarily think about uh, writing unit tests or things like that for PowerShell code. Uh, no signing, you can sign PowerShell code. That's kind of a big one, especially if it's running on sensitive systems, you might want something in place that prevents unsigned code from running. So your PowerShell code should be part of those artifacts that you sign. If you were to deploy an app or something, you might want to sign it. Same with your PowerShell scripts. Uh, linting, there is a linter available for PowerShell. It's called PS Script Analyzer, and we'll talk about it in a couple of minutes here. Uh, but again, like on its own, doesn't ruin your entire, um, the, the integrity of your PowerShell code, but it's one of those things that kind of adds up. Uh, no peer review. This is kind of a big one in my opinion. If you are a person who writes some PowerShell code and it goes and modifies your infrastructure, it goes and spins up a bunch of servers or spins a bunch down or who, like whatever you're doing. Maybe it deploys your services. Is it just one person who types some code and then deploys it? In most other apps and services, you wouldn't run it that way. You would have somebody else probably look at your code before it goes and touches prod, before it goes and impacts the stuff that makes you money or keeps you up and running and empowers the rest of your organization to make money, you probably want maybe a second set of eyes on it. So instead of like deleting all of the users, it deletes the users whose accounts are inactive. Something like that. Uh, no difference between source and deployed artifacts. We'll talk a little bit about why that's important, but hey, if you wrote tests, it's in kind of an ops PowerShell mentality, it's really easy to get caught up and accidentally deploy all your tests and everything with your code wherever it ends up living. Not great. Uh, no approval consideration either. This is kind of falls in with the peer review, right? Like who gives permission or is there a change management in place? If you're working without a dev environment and you just uh, remote desktop into a server, open the PowerShell IAC, write your script and test against prod, not the best way of going through your uh, code authoring habits, right? Like you open the door for a lot of trouble. And you might be fine, you might have run this way for years or even longer, but it's messy behaviors that will inevitably get you into trouble the longer you perform them. So what do you do, right? It, and there's no magic silver bullet like, oh, there's this, and you, oh, this is all you have to do, just download this YAML and plug your thing in. Works on any cloud. Like, it, it doesn't really work like that. The same concepts that you heard in the, in the keynote earlier, the same concepts that you're already familiar with in terms of CICD are applicable to PowerShell. And I'm here to show you how they're uh, applicable to PowerShell. First, like the basics, right? Um, Mo many of the people who write a lot of PowerShell code come from an ops background. And so there are people who are maybe their Windows admins because PowerShell is Microsoft. It's available everywhere now, but it was originally only available on uh, Windows. So oh, I'm a Windows admin, I'm used to right clicking and new usering and things like that in Active Directory. And very comfortable in a GUI. And now there's this PowerShell thing, and oh man, if I wanna manage Exchange, I've gotta do it through this new command line thing. And so it's not people who have a ton of software development uh, prowess. It's not people who have a lot of formal software development um, education or practice either. And so you end up with like really basic things like, hey, it should probably be stored in source control somewhere, right? 
Like whatever your favorite flavor of source control is, it's probably a good idea because you'd be surprised how often that, oh, where do you keep all your PowerShell stuff? Well, it sits in this file share on this server. Not great, right? Like it, it, that's not how you treat production code when it's your line of business application. It shouldn't be how you treat the code that uh, you use to support those activities as well. I don't think I really have to extol the virtues of source control to this audience. Uh, peer reviews, we talked about that before. If nobody else looks at code before the person who wrote it runs it, you open yourself up to scenarios where somebody has blinders on, doesn't even think of an edge case, and all of a sudden you're in trouble, right? That's not a good thing. And an approval workflow kind of goes hand in hand with the peer reviews. This is, again, very basic stuff, but important just to at least touch base on before we keep going. Build stuff. You go, well, that's something that I do in like a compiled language. Like I thought PowerShell was interpreted. I didn't know, like, what are you gonna build here? Well, PowerShell has this uh, concept called modules. And if you're not familiar with the term, uh, in PowerShell, they're a collection of functions and classes and things like that that compose a deployable artifact. Um, and so you install a module and it imports a whole bunch of commands and things into your PowerShell session and you can use them to do whatever specialized function you wrote the module for. And performance matters in all cases, right? If you're not considering performance, then you're doing yourself and your users a disservice. There's uh, kind of a common way of organizing your module where each different function that you write is in its own file. And then when it's imported at load time, they're all imported individually into your uh, PowerShell session. However, if you just put them all in one and import it all at once, it's literally orders of magnitude faster. But that's not very obvious to people if you don't do performance testing. And it's just things like that where the way you organize your code so that it makes sense when you're writing it and authoring it and improving it and iterating on it cyclically is not necessarily the same set of files that you are uh, best off to deploy to your end users, right? And so assembling the deployable artifacts uh, is often different than what you're actually writing with your um, code authoring process. And similarly, if you're writing tests, you don't want to deploy your tests along with it, even though they're all stored in the same place. So when it's time to ship them, you want to make sure that you've actually, it, it's sort of a build process, even though it's not compiling anything in the traditional sense. Testing, like, again, not to harp on it, but if you're not testing the code that goes and modifies your ability for your organization to make money, or if you're not testing the stuff that might prevent you from making money if it goes wrong, you're really putting yourself in a bad way. You're really opening the door to get hurt. So PS Script Analyzer, I mentioned it earlier, is a static code analysis tool. If that's a new term for anybody, uh, it effectively breaks PowerShell down into its abstract syntax tree, which is just a, like a tree-like hierarchical representation of everything that's in your script or your module or whatever your artifact is. And it examines it and uh, runs a bunch of rules, things like thou shalt not uh, use plain text passwords, thou shalt not use outdated commandlets, thou shalt not, uh, what's another good example? Um, sorry? No aliases, yeah. PowerShell has aliases like a lot of other languages, which are great in the command line, but not great in a production script. Um, and it's extensible, so you can write your own rules, you can uh, optionally enable it to uh, enforce a specific style, which is really important for people who don't have a lot of coding experience. This is their first language, this is their first time actually doing any of this, and uh, they're not necessarily very uh, polished in their habits, and it looks like a woodpecker's been slamming the tab key whenever they're running code. It's not great, right? Um, it's got a bunch of variable names that aren't named very intelligently, or they're overwriting built-in variables and wondering why it doesn't work. Uh, things like that. PS Script Analyzer has, um, oh, I can't remember now, I was just looking at it. It's like 60-something rules that ship with it, and they're not all perfect, and you can suppress them if you need to. Like, if you know better, then uh, you, can, you can put your suppression in. If you have additional things that you want to check for, you can write your own rules with relative convenience. And so I'm a really big fan of PS Script Analyzer. I've contributed a few rules myself. And um, 
its flexibility and extensibility make it a um, kind of a critical tool when it comes to um, making sure that your code is ready to be run in an environment that you care about. Uh, the VS Code, uh, Visual Studio Code, has a PowerShell extension, and it includes uh, PS Script Analyzer. So the things that you're used to in a lot of other IDEs that where it pops up with squiggly lines and tells you, oh, you haven't, you're not using this variable after you assign it. You assign it, and then you never use it again. Or things just where um, PowerShell has interesting things like where if you're doing an equality comparison like, uh, to null specifically, like is this string null or is this integer null or is this object null, null needs to be on the left side of the equality operator. A lot of people don't know that, but it's kind of a weird quirk just of how PowerShell works. And if you don't do that, you open yourself up to some weird behavior. If you're doing is an object equal to null instead of is null equal to an object, it can have different results and that's weird, but there's a PS Script Analyzer rule that tells you that, and you can catch it as you're typing rather than later when you're running your tests and things like that. Uh, it has a whole bunch of other features in it too that I'm sure its creators would love for me to go on about. But it's, uh, if you're gonna write PowerShell, Visual Studio Code with the PowerShell extension, there's also a PowerShell Preview extension if you want the newer features faster, is uh, definitely something that you should be using. Windows comes with the PowerShell ISE, which is like built in included, it's even on servers. Uh, but it's not deprecated, but it's no longer getting new features. It's no longer getting anything new for it. And so when you're running PowerShell code, this is where you're recommended to be in Visual Studio Code with the PowerShell extension. And then kind of the big kahuna of testing in PowerShell is Pester. It's a test of mock framework. You can use it to uh, actively test your code. So where PS Script Analyzer does not actually run the code, it just analyzes the code. Excuse me, Pester can run the code and uh, compare its uh, output and everything to the output that you're expecting. And so unit tests or in integration tests are written in Pester when you're doing them in PowerShell most commonly. And uh, if you wanna do things like test-driven development, it's a good idea, um, or it's arguably, uh, people have a lot of opinions on it, but say you think test-driven development is a good idea, well, wouldn't you like to do that for your PowerShell code as well? Probably. But if all of your PowerShell code just exists in a random file on a file server or in a little text box in your CICD cloud, like if you open Azure DevOps and you put in the PowerShell build step and you just type the inline script, well, like, okay, maybe it works. But maybe it doesn't work in these edge cases. Maybe if you'd written some tests for it and treated it as an artifact that was of consequence, then it would perform a little bit better for you. Right? And so Pester, check that out. This is um, kind of a big rabbit hole there. You can use Pester for more than just testing PowerShell code. You can just use Pester in PowerShell to test the state of your other systems. You can use them for um, health checks or things like that, where you just use the web commandlets, like invoke web request or invoke rest method to go hit your APIs and see if they're working. You can, and so it has nothing to do with testing your PowerShell code, but you can use PowerShell code in Pester to uh, test your other systems and um, apps to make sure that they're working appropriately as well. And since it can output like end unit formatted results, it can feed really conveniently into whatever CI CD systems you might uh, want to use it with. Signing things, right? So in the scenario where somebody just remote desktops into a server, opens up the ISC and types their code, probably not signing it. But again, if you're deploying it anywhere you care about or to a place where people might have access to it, signing is a good idea. And so example code, uh, I'm looking at this now and seeing problems with it, like it's not my favorite. But all of these extensions, do I have a, does it really work on the screen? All of these extensions are things that you can sign using the set authentic code signature commandlet that just comes with PowerShell. So if you, um, there's a couple of variables that aren't assigned in the, in the slide here, but you find a signing certificate and use it to sign all of these artifacts. And now when you deploy them, you have some degree of certainty that they'll be in that state when you actually go to run them. Or if you go to go check them out, uh, well, you're getting reports that they're not working as you hope they would, you can go and see if they've been modified by a power user or something that I figured out they can make their own local copy and change it. Well, now you have a signature mismatch or something. And um, you can validate with the signature, right? Signing stuff is always kind of a good idea in general. 
especially when it's going to prod. Deploying things, kind of deploy conf, right? Like you thought we weren't going to talk about deploying PowerShell artifacts. But PowerShell runs in so many different places. There's sort of the world is your oyster mentality about where it might end up, right? It might end up just traditionally on a file share. Like if it has to go there, it might go in onto like a user workstation or a file server, or if you're running an Active Directory environment onto Sysfall or something like that, right? Like that's a pretty straightforward place to copy a file to. Like I'm probably not blowing anyone's mind with that. NuGet feeds are often overlooked. There's a PowerShell gallery. It's literally just called PowerShellGallery.com. And it's a NuGet feed of, uh, it's a public NuGet feed of different PowerShell modules. And so when uh, the PowerShell team goes and releases a new version of PS Script Analyzer, or when the folks who maintain Pester go and release a new version of that module, they're available on the PowerShell gallery. And so it's a big feed of all these different things. Anybody can publish to it, so it's a little bit of the Wild West. You want to make sure that you understand what it is you're running when you're going to run it. But it's a really powerful way to distribute your modules to a public audience. If you're not interested in sharing them publicly, internal systems, uh, MyGet, any NuGet feed, right? Like the, there's tons of them. Uh, Azure Artifacts is, uh, is one that I've come to really enjoy using. Uh, but NuGet, it, uh, PowerShell comes with package management commandlets. You can just use the NuGet um, executable or whatever as well and distribute your uh, built and deployable artifacts that way. And then to the cloud. I say any cloud at all. I'm sure you can think of an example that doesn't support that. Uh, but Azure, AWS, Google, you can, use these, uh, you can use PowerShell to interact with these clouds in a lot of different unique and interesting ways. A lot of the examples that you see are written in other languages, but that isn't to understate the flexibility and applicability of PowerShell for these different systems as well. There's a lot of different helpers that can uh, make these tasks and others related to writing PowerShell easier. This is not one of them. This is my cat helping put away groceries. Her name's Callie, and she's really helpful. Uh, other, helpful other helpful things include uh, all these and more that you see on this slide. Invoke build and Saki, the P is silent for some great reason, are uh, like test and build runners. They kind of coordinate the different scripts and steps that you run. You can create dependencies on each other and uh, kind of do a code-defined pipeline that will run the same in your CI/CD systems as they will on your local dev workstation. Uh, Plaster is a great one for kind of doing scaffolding and templating and saying, okay, well, every time I build a module, I want it to have these subdirectories, I want it to have these basic files, uh, and I want it to kind of look like this, and I, want, I don't want it to be named source, I want it to be named SRC instead, and things like that. And you can come up with these plaster templates that can make starting out a lot easier. Uh, Platypus is for um, building the help documentation that comes with your uh, deployable PowerShell artifacts. You are writing help for anything that somebody else runs, right? Exactly. I saw two thumbs up, but they were from the same person. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Configuration and PS Depend are really helpful for end users who are um, using modules that pull dependencies on other modules. Right? So if I run a module that depends on the Active Directory module, I can use PS Depend to help uh, make sure that those dependencies are in place a little bit more conveniently. Same with configuration. If I've got uh, like user settings in a function or in a module that modifies my prompt, I can use the configuration module. It's literally just called configuration uh, to help keep those in place. And so just to kind of summarize and paint the broad picture of avoiding the mess. It's really not any more complicated or difficult to get your head around than CICD for regular apps and systems. It's just knowing about the different tools and features that are out there and thinking about them uh, through the lens of developing PowerShell scripts, modules, and code. Covering the basics, just like you would in anything you write. You should probably go in source control and somebody else should look at it before it goes and runs in prod, right? Like, not an earth-shattering concept, but something that people don't necessarily think about when they're talking about PowerShell. Building things. Again, it's an interpreted language, not a compiled language, but that doesn't mean that what you write and store in source control is what you end up deploying to production. And so there's some type of transformation process that has to occur between writing the code and it going into production, and so you might as well call it a build, right? Testing. 
There's linting, PS script analyzer, static code analysis, Pester we just talked about, for doing a more active and involved uh, methodology of testing. Deploying, wherever you want to deploy it. PowerShell runs on Windows, Linux, Mac. It runs in like all of the different cloud, like Travis CI and uh, Azure DevOps and all the other ones that I can think of. Um, it, it runs pretty much anywhere you want it to run. Uh, and if it doesn't, there's probably somebody else who's already working on getting it to run there right now. <clears throat> and then there's so many different tools. A lot of them are even written in PowerShell, so you can dissect and peek out the pieces that are good for you and get rid of the ones that don't. If you just search for PowerShell uh, projects on GitHub, you'll find tons of them. Uh, and you'll often find, rather than having to reinvent the wheel, somebody's already uh, come up with round for you. And you can pick and choose and trim stuff out, whatever you want, whatever the license allows you to do, right? And so that's really it. Like that's CICD for PowerShell that isn't a mess. It's not really different than CICD for your apps and systems in terms of what you're doing. It's again, just thinking about it through a PowerShell lens and being aware of some of the tools that are in place. The processes and the way that people think don't really change. It's just some of the tools and some of the products that you use that do. So I'd like to thank you for spending this time with me and big shout out to the organizers for putting this uh, conference together. I'm really excited about the format. Uh, Sasha in particular has helped me a lot on Twitter with uh, some of the questions I've had. And so uh, I'd like to thank you again and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference as well. Thank you. Uh, I had a bunch of questions there might be related. I'm wondering how do you deal with like big gotchas of PowerShell, like versioning difference between PowerShell core and regular PowerShell, as well as like weird behaviors with namespaces, like variable can be available within the module that kind of defined it, but outside of that module it can't. So like do you have a library of patterns or anti-patterns in this sense? Yeah, so it, it could get a little bit tricky because up until um, PowerShell 6, uh, PowerShell was all backwards compatible. PowerShell 5, whatever you wrote, uh, would mostly run on PowerShell uh, 3. Or sorry, whatever you wrote in PowerShell 3 would run on PowerShell 5. Whatever you wrote in PowerShell 4 would run on 5.1. When the PowerShell team made the decision to um, base PowerShell on .NET Core so that it could be run on more platforms, they uh, broke that pattern. And so things that worked in, like out grid view is a popular commandlet that takes whatever the, the object representation is and puts it into a GUI. That doesn't work because the Windows Forms controls don't exist in .NET Core. Uh, and so there's a long list of examples that fit that type of it worked here, but it doesn't work here. What type of design patterns can I expect to try to follow to make this easier? Um, and to be honest, there's not a ton of um, secrets or anything like that that I can really offer. I know that they're constantly working to bring it to parity, uh, bring uh, PowerShell Core to parity with Windows PowerShell. And that PowerShell 7, which I think there's a release candidate for it right now that's available. Um, I'm not sure when it's going GA, but uh, it's coming soon. W addresses a lot of those concerns, uh, especially for people that are running on Windows, where you expect a Windows PowerShell type of experience, even in PowerShell Core. Uh, a lot of those concerns will be addressed. I don't have a lot of specific information that I have just off the top of my head. Um, but if you check out the PowerShell uh, GitHub, or if you hop on the uh, Slack and Discord, you can get a lot more comprehensive answer to that type of question, especially if you have specific things that you want to know about. Um, we, could, we could talk about that all day. Uh, or find me on Twitter as well. I'm happy to point you in the right direction as somebody who knows. All right, awesome. Let's hear it again for Thomas. Okay, so. We're going to transition now into the part of this presentation where it's no longer a presentation, it's now a discussion. Uh, and so we really invite everyone to come down towards the front of the room if you can, if you'd like to be a part of our discussion. Now, to be a participant in this discussion, it's important to remember that you have to speak into the microphone uh, so that we can capture that for um, posterity, uh, so that we can all go back and review the discussion later as well. So, um, Sasha, do you mind just advancing the slide for me. 
Real quick as well. I have stickers for whoever participates. They're chocolatey stickers. Ooh. They're delicious stickers. So help us by uh, participating in the discussion, uh, and you'll get a sticker too. That's awesome. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Um, so before I ask this first question, one more round of applause for Thomas. That was a great talk. Thank you. Okay. Come on down. So just to remind you of some of the rules, in addition to like speak into the microphone, that's the most important rule to remember. The next thing to remember is that this is a discussion about the topic, not necessarily a discussion about the talk, right? So the topic was around CICD with PowerShell. So I will pose this question to the audience. Uh, what challenges are you facing in this area? Uh, and if someone would like to share, just make yourself known. Here we go. And Chris will help with mic running. Okay, I have plenty of challenges. So one of them is gotchas of PowerShell, uh, which I discover. Um, I mean, I can talk in depth about it, but, but just don't want to steal the time. Uh, so gotchas is one. Uh, inability to mock functional style commandlets is another one. Or maybe I just need to learn more. In C Sharp, you are usually interface based. You can mock anything. In PowerShell, registry access direct, file access direct, how to mock that stuff. Uh, that's another challenge. And maybe people can share their experience how they do it. And then probably the big one is cultural one. So I work at Microsoft, um, and I know some internal teams at Microsoft that made a decision to completely have different automation language or even tools. Some, some, some teams decided to write their own parsers and have C Sharp written executables just because people with traditional language knowledge don't want to learn PowerShell. Just feel about it as a subpar kind of not really truly first class uh, programming language. So these are my challenges. <laughs> All right. I'm happy to talk. Um, so some of the challenges I've got, just particularly around things like when you're doing automation it's not considered to be the same as programming or development, so all the automation stuff ends up somewhere totally different. And so that's something we're trying to track down is this, this mess of scripting languages that appears and it's not, you, you mentioned it, it's not in source code control, it doesn't get peer reviewed. Trying to get that tracked down and put into some place and a process for that where people aren't afraid of the process, trying to teach them, hey, this process really helps, so it's that, that mess and the culture around cleaning up the mess. It's a challenge. Um, so my team is, uh, we're pretty fresh in the whole DevOps world for our company. And uh, our challenge is a lot of us came from the ops side of things. So it's trying to break the habit of, hey, let's do this in the GUI and try to do this in PowerShell. So we're still trying to figure out how to get people to adopt trying to do some of the automation via PowerShell. So if anybody has. <laughs> yeah, so I, I have a pretty similar problem where, you know, I, I'm from a coding background, but then I'm trying to lead DevOps across my entire organization. And so I've got an ops team that I've got one guy who's really good with PowerShell and scripting and treats it like it's a coding language, and then I've got an ops team that's like, wait, I have to check in my code, and so that's, that's been my big struggle, is how do I get my not developer people to realize that they can fire developers now? Oh, sorry. So um, I actually come from an interesting background. Um, my background's mainly process improvement through automation, and so getting our developers to adopt to using tools like PowerShell in your code to you know streamline their pipelines always been easy for me but moving over to the ops side oh boy you're right that's complicated and that's where really coming in play is having someone who really can champion that kind of thing so you said like you had a guy that's really good at it maybe have him do like a five minute little presentation or 15 minute lunch and learn on it that's been really helpful for us And just on the note of changing culture, like just as important as the first person on the team who kind of champions it, even more important in my opinion is the first follower. Is the person who you identify on the team that is ready to learn the new thing and wasn't just hired on to do it, that is already ingrained in the team culture that kind of buys in, right? And commits and has an existing reputation on the team. And that way when the 
a person who's specifically there to help um, bring everyone up to speed says something and the other person with the existing reputation and that social capital that already exists on the team, uh, they can, the initial person can borrow that social capital and everybody else kind of follows a lot more quickly. And so if you're the person on the team who's responsible for upskilling your team or leading that change, it's really important for you to identify those people on your team that you can count on to be your, um, your first followers. Uh, so in regards to the question about getting ops people to, to follow along, uh, I've found if you build a pipeline for their deployment and configuration management and then hand it to them, um, they're more likely to commit their code to source control. So if you, we do a lot of stuff in uh, Azure. Um, so I will build pipelines uh, that allow people to do change management, um, deploy functions, a lot of ops-based stuff. Uh, and then I hand them the pipeline and say, look, all you gotta do is hit go and your stuff will show up. And as soon as that happens, they go, oh, I don't have to log in and configure stuff and change my password and do all these other things. They can just write their code and go. Um, they're more, uh, uh, they will adopt it more quickly because it's less work. And so by showing them they don't have to do as much, um, they can then, uh, they'll adopt it uh, quicker. Can we ask questions? <laughs> yes, you can ask questions. Uh, so I have a question uh, to the uh, talk. Uh, classes were not mentioned. Is there a particular reason why? Uh, yeah, so classes are a new concept to PowerShell since, I want to say five, uh, PowerShell five. And when they were first brought out, it was largely to satisfy folks who had a background in other languages and were coming to come write PowerShell, uh, especially like C-sharp devs who work at Microsoft who are going, I'm so used to writing classes, why can't I write classes in PowerShell? And so they implemented it. Um, and there's a few features that are kind of like that. In PowerShell 7, there's a ternary operator where there wasn't one before. And they're historically not features that operations people really cared a lot about because they didn't exist in that paradigm. If you, if you don't know about them and you never had them to start with and PowerShell is your first language and you're kind of a point and click admin learning to code, you don't care about classes. You don't care about ternary operators. You care that it's verbose, which PowerShell is. It's got really long commandlet names instead of really short executable names. Uh, and so there's a small number of people in the community who have a lot of professional development experience in other languages who were super excited that there were classes. And then when they were really first launched, they weren't that great. And then people didn't really fall in love with them right away. And it was sort of a first impressions problem. Um, again, that's my opinion, not the opinion of Microsoft. Um, and so you don't tend to see a ton of um, people writing classes in PowerShell for, for that reason, those two reasons. Because as soon as you start thinking about classes, people start tending to write their PowerShell command lists in C Sharp instead of in PowerShell, uh, which you can do. You can write all your, like a PowerShell command lit in C Sharp. Um, and the other one is, if you're just starting to get into coding in general, you don't care if you can write a, a custom object or a distinct class uh, of your own. You just want the thing to uh, onboard new users into your HR system, right? Uh, and that's why you don't tend to see a lot of people talk a ton about classes when they're talking about PowerShell. It's not that they're not good. They are now. Uh, they And they have a lot of value and flexibility that you can certainly use to make your existing scripts and modules better. Uh, but they're not overwhelmingly popular in the community. All right, so we've heard a lot of the challenges. Let's shift gears for a minute here and ask this question. What successes have you had in this area? And I know we've already heard a couple of small successes, but what else? What else are you doing that's working really well with your teams? So, I mean, so my team that is doing infrastructure now, they're managed services group, and so we have probes on all of our customers' machines, and we actually just set up a full chocolatey setup and deployment there, so all of our probes are always the same with the same versions of all the scripts that exist in the, the master branches for our various repos, so that's been a big, big help there, especially since we got acquired, now we have a lot of compliance concerns, so now we can actually prove that all of our probes are compliant and the same. So I think there are two things that, that um, stick out of my mind. One is just the, the, the tooling around being able to treat PowerShell as a um, package, package stuff up and deliver it like that. The, 
the changes to culture to do that instills the right kind of discipline, I think. And then the other piece is just the, the extension of the PowerShell desired state configuration overview that gives you the ability to just say, this is the state that I want, and PowerShell provides you the ability to make that happen. And, and learning how to use that effectively, I think, is something that, that, that would move people you know, technologically and culturally down the thing. So I see that as it's not stuff I've used, but both those are improvements and, and opportunities to improve my teams um, you know, worldwide. So I'm looking forward to that. So success stories from my side for PowerShell is, uh, again, free today, I talk in freeze. Uh, so the first one is the level of penetration uh, specifically into a Windows platform, and then Azure consequently that PowerShell gives you, which comes from an uh, internal requirement of every component be PowerShell manageable, so that's amazing. Um, another thing is, uh, well, with introduction of classes, now you can write polymorphic tools, which you could always do in Python, so maybe that would, would be a better language for Jeffrey Snower to take, but yeah, we have PowerShell anyways. So now you can polymorphically do things. You can have a graph library that generates you a graph script in, in one set of attributes, or it generates actual graph diagrams if you just provide another attribute, and everything is done internally polymorphically. That's amazing, and that takes some time for ops people to understand. You can, you can deploy similarly following the same steps, but your service fabric deployment will be one implementation, your Kubernetes deployment will be another. They will be super different, but steps are still the same. So that's an important thing. And uh, one uh, probably most obvious is uh, error handling. Uh, I'm so tired of really bad scripts where people write CMDs that have no error handling by default, output just goes and nobody looks at it, uh, while in our script I have a strict requirement, well actually to have strict uh, scripting model, so that everything is turned into exception, which will be terminal unless handled with try catch, and that's a huge benefit to overall quality of, to, of scripting automation and stuff. I will preview the uh, talk for 2 o'clock today, so uh, Mandy's going to talk about an abstraction layer that was written in PowerShell, over 550 uh, integration tests using uh, um, uh, Pester and other uh, techniques to uh, fully integration test that abstraction layer, so that's uh, a lot of the good success we've had with PowerShell in the last couple of years. Uh, yeah, so um, I, I kind of tackled it kind of from both perspectives. I, I kind of am a software architect uh, on a traditional ops team, and so I have a lot of challenges with various people coming from an ops background. PowerShell to them is running commands, not writing scripts. Um, and, and I found a kind of two-pronged approach. I, I tend to, we tend to have a lot of success when we kind of enable those users. It's like we, we package up modules for them. We, you know, Cameron talked about how we build a pipeline for them and just give it to them. That lets them go and do their thing. A lot of those folks have very little interest in, in becoming developers developers in their mindset. Um, but we also have other folks on the ops team who are very passionate about learning the, the best way to do how, what is all this cool stuff? What's Pester? How do I write tests? Why do you do that? And, and those ones we kind of um, we kind of like take under our wing and we grow them. You know, the, the, and, and the skills they learn there, they're easy for them to get into. They've been writing PowerShell here and there a little bit. They're learning good practices. When you start dropping them into like Python environments and stuff, a lot of those good practices come with them. Um, these are software development quality aspects, not PowerShell specific aspects, um, but you do have to find where that line is in your team because you're going to find people that have zero interest in doing all of that, and you're going to find people that are really passionate and interested, and treating them separately. I think we've had a lot of success um, tackling that from both angles. Uh. Awesome. So our third and final question for our discussion, um, I've just made you all wizards. You have magic wand. So what would you like to see in the next two to five years in this space? And I'm especially um, interested in folks that haven't had a chance to share something yet. If uh, it's fine if you don't want to, but if you haven't had a chance, this is this is it. More stickers. I mean, I know personally for myself. Um, my company, we haven't begun to embrace and adopt Tracker yet, but I just recently learned about that and how to really utilize it. Um, right now, one of my challenges is working on streamlining our onboarding process for developers, and products like Trackly will help me create, use my scripts that I've already written, just streamline them, get them running faster.
Um, so something I would like to see is uh, project management for ops understand that uh, things like um, test-driven development, uh, infrastructure as code should be done prior to these scripts being written. Uh, what we see a lot is, hey, I need a thing. I'll manually build out the infrastructure. I'll write my code or my function or my API or whatever it is to do this um, operations type of uh, um, uh, this, this operation. Um, but they forget all the, the pieces that should come first, and it's because they're not used to. They're used to standing up a server, so I write a script to stand up a server, and it's done. Um, and then we end up in this place where Ryan or, and I end up now, where all of these things are done, but there's no test, there's no documentation. Infrastructure still be man, still manually be, being stood up between dev and production and those types of things. I, I agree with this point. I would... Uh, I would really like to see a way when, uh, maybe for conferences, books, educational materials, uh, well, tighter interview loops, I guess, uh, for people who take ops positions, they understand that it's not about GUI clicking anymore, that everything you do, no matter how you do it for the first time, when you prototype, should be replicatable afterwards. And it's not like you're going to remove your own job by automating this. You're just going to move on to more interesting things. Yeah, but it's funny, because I think we've all got things we'd like that aren't really specific to PowerShell. Uh, so I'm going to continue the trend. Uh, I'd like to see a future space where my operators don't actually get to run PowerShell willy-nilly in environments that they have no business running willy-nilly PowerShell in. And part of that's from, you know, stuff Thomas talked about, you know, signed signed modules and stuff like that. Um, you, you look at how CI, CD is supposed to work in the ops world, and the, the idea is removing the human element, right, so that the automation systems that are tested and verifiable and repeatable, you know, don't break stuff. Uh, I'd like I'd like to see more of that actually implemented. Uh, we, you know, we as an industry have been, or well, maybe the folks here as an industry have been talking about it for a number of years now. It's a very hard change to get pushed through an organization, though, um, especially an organization the size of mine. Um, so I don't know if that's a two-year or five-year or maybe even a 20-year thing, but I think the tooling and the, the standards and practices that we're encouraging and creating, um, I think that's going to make it an easier sell um, You know, to, to executives and leadership teams when you can verifiably show that you break systems less uh, even though you're moving quicker uh, I think that's a good thing and, and and you know again the maturity that PowerShell brings to it as you know what was started as a operation scripting language you know things like classes test frameworks and stuff you know all the stuff that Thomas put up there all those little tools and stuff most of them are all built in PowerShell that was one of the big selling things uh, when Jeffrey Snow built PowerShell was PowerShell would be extendable via PowerShell. So you don't have to go and learn C Sharp to write commandlets. You have scripted commandlets. You can write PowerShell. All of those things, you know, Pester, I think, is written, you know, mostly in PowerShell. Uh, PS Script Analyzer, mostly in PowerShell. Uh, a lot of them have evolved for performance reasons over time, but the fact is that all of this tooling and capability comes from the community. Um, and I think, yeah, just more of the same. So. All right. Thank you so much. I'd like to um, just thank you.